Hello and welcome to another episode of Mysteries with a History, where I'll take you on the wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. Hello to everyone in the live chat, the live chatters. Tomorrow on Strange Paradigms, I will be joined by the awesome Nicole Sackage, and we will cover the strange and mysterious news items of the last week, starting at 3 p.m. PST. So make sure you are there joining in the live chat. Also, I want to remind everyone that my Discord server now has an after show chat room and almost 700 members able to live chat, share files, text chat, or voice chat post videos and pictures. And the rooms range from UFOs to research tech, Skinwalker Ranch, tell your own experience, the afterlife, and so many other cool chat rooms. It's safe, secure, friendly, and a free way to build our community here. Now on to today's show. California is a state known for Hollywood its beautiful beaches and forests, and the world-renowned vineyards and wines of Napa Valley. However, there's a lot more to the state than meets the eye. The Golden State has a mysterious history as well as a notorious history of murders, mysterious locations, and weird sightings of cryptids and UFOs. We also have the 2004 Nimitz encounter with the Tic Tac off of San Diego, the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot footage, and of course, course, the famous Joshua Tree location. And that's just a few items we will cover. There's a lot more. Now, it is also the home state of my awesome co-host, Jimmy Church. So he's pretty enthusiastic for this show. Let's welcome him in. Jimmy, how you doing, buddy? How you doing? I'm you doing, doing real good. How you doing? Look at my lights look mysterious today. I think it's appropriate. It's ah, only appropriate for today. Ah, it looks it looks ghostly. Oh, hold on. Okay. I'll, I'll just, oh, man. I got to fire up another computer to fire up the lights. Here's the deal. Um, another great week, Christina. Um, uh, this is a, a great uh, subject. And everybody knows, as I move this i'll move my mic forward so i can do the see everybody gets to witness this in real time i'll just i'll just do something like that let's do a mix of lights today let's do this and we'll do that oh that's better see i don't look as mysterious now um if you want if you want to go strange go west <laughs> just come that to seems court. to be the case. Everything happens out here. And so to gear up for the show today, I just I just mashed, I murdered a big bowl of ramen. And only appropriate. Uh, yeah, and and uh today habanero sauce. Oh chili red chili flakes and uh yeah I'm, I'm good to go man about five minutes ago i was like i'm <laughs> but uh it's so so good so yeah I'm, I'm fully prepared for the show and as we roll into this because we have a ton it, 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 california's like got it all right we We've have a ton. ton but but i want to say this christina uh you have uh become such a great part of the UFO community. Um, we have never met. Christina and I have never met. That's We've right. never met. We've never met. Uh, we talk and we do these shows. But uh, Christina, I think it's about time. And I want to see the reaction in the chat. I think we need to drag you out to a UFO conference. You need to come and do a meet and greet. You need to say hello. You got to take the selfies. You got to walk the red carpet. I'm really and awkward in person. I, I See, we need to overcome that. So let's go to the chat room. 
How would you do we need to drag Christina to a UFO conference? Do we need to pull her? I mean, look, look, I, I want to and, and I intend to. But like work and school right now are really eating up my time. But once once that all passes, I'll probably go to a conference and say, hey, and then obviously like give out packets of ramen uh, to show my gratitude. Let's do that. But hey, I could write a note. I can write a note, a sick like a doctor's man. note. Doctor's are, are you a doctor? <laughs> I can, I can. Uh, I'll sign it. I'll sign it, uh, 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 Donald Duck. But it do- doesn't matter. Um, I, I think we can uh, do this. But I think we need to drag you out and and get you, in you know, time. out of that shell. And oh, I, I don't want to hear that in time. Well, I we have a lot to cover today let's get into it nature cam (laughs) hd thank you so much for the super sticker it says one love to mi amiga christina and to my wolfman jack buddy love the interaction between the two of you thank you christina just took a right turn drove the car in another direction and because uh, i am the driver today mark thank you so much for the super (laughs) sticker jimmy please say his last name Tasaka. Oh man, I practice. It's just tradition now. Yeah, I practice that all uh, every day, all morning, uh, in preparation for the show. Let's. uh, uh, Oh, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for the super chats. I know we haven't got into it. We are going to get into today's show. There's a lot to cover, and I thought Utah was a really sick state. This state, oh my gosh. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, every, everything goes on out here, and and nothing surprises me anymore. Um, and the 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 cool thing about California, um, and now we're going to cover uh, today. We're going to cover mysterious things, mm-hmm. uh, disappearances, uh, uh, murder. Uh, UFOs. We're probably going to be able to throw in some Bigfoot and and locations. Um, it's it, it's crazy. And and I was telling Christina uh, earlier this week, everybody, when she hit me with this idea, and I'm literally just sitting on my phone, going, "Okay, we got." And I'm writing this down. I'm like, "Can you slow down, Jimmy?" And 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 I just scratched. The surface. I mean, it it is. It's a crazy. This this could be like a four part series, just tapping into the craziness and the fun. I might add of of California. So yes, no question I, there. I know, I know you're you're itching to get into this, and nobody wants to hear me yap forever. Um, let's go straight into it. I'm excited. Now, uh, we have, um, let me go to my list. Well, before we do that, Jessica, thank you so much. It says, I've been watching the first and older episodes of all of the mysteries with the history and the other shows too. Well, hopefully you're enjoying those as well. We've covered some really interesting topics. Now I was more awkward when we started, but here we are today. And as Jimmy says, never watch your older episodes. Just, just keep chugging along. (laughs) Move forward. <laughs> Don't so, look back. So we have a list here. Um, this list is up to Christina. I doubt that we're going to do this in any kind of order, but I'm excited on any direction uh, that we go here uh, today, Christina. So I'm curious, where do you want to start? Let's start with the Edwards Air Force Base UFO sighting in 1965. Let's. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's. Well, uh, one of one of many um, at, right. at Edwards Air Force Base, including my sighting uh, that I had out there too. And and if we have the time, uh, I'll give you a, a condensed version of that. Time to hand out the signed package of ramen. See, yes, it's that, genius. Can it's you genius. Imagine, can you imagine? <laughs> uh, you go, uh, Christina. Here's the deal. Think think about this. You get a case. They're ten cents each. Well, now they're thirty-five cents. Like it's it's kind of it's kind of hitting my budget. Yeah, but you're going to charge fifty bucks, right? Fifty bucks, and get out that gold pen. <laughs> anyway, where are we going to start today, Christina? It's like we're going to start with the Edwards Air Force Base UFO sighting, and like you said, there are a few, but we will be covering um, probably the most famous one. So on October 7th, 1965, reports of a dozen 
12 or more flying objects were seen over the Edwards Air Force Base, which sent a fighter jet scrambling in pursuit, but nothing turned up. So according to a statement by an on-duty pilot, Daryl Clark, from records now hosted by the Nuclear Connection Project, here is what he said. And I'm reading it, quote, I grabbed the binoculars and got a better look. The UFOs were about 10 miles northwest of my position at first sight. It continued south until it was almost due west of me. Then there it made a 90 degree right turn and started to climb at a 45 degree to 50 degree angle. All I could see was the pulsating, not rotating light and what appeared to be a small cloud pushed by a vehicle I could not see. The UFO never leveled off. It continued to climb. Aircraft always show movement in relation to the stars. But as this light moved higher, it seemed to become more stabilized with the stars. In other words, it appeared to move right out into space until it finally passed out of view. Pretty interesting plan. It happens every single night in my backyard. What? Every night. Every night. Um, and how serious am I being with this? Um, last night, <laughs> the show went, and uh, I've got uh, stuff cooking. Now walk out on the back patio just to get some fresh air. I'm out there for two seconds, and and I I, I just I, I did this. I just kind of looked up for no reason. And right above Edwards, in, in that direction, uh, northeast of my position, about seven miles away, it's, 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 it's in my backyard. This thing lights up, and, and so uh, I see these two stars, and one was kind of bright, so I just, I, you know, I just, and, and we're lit up and, and went towards Edwards and, and faded out. The whole thing lasted about two seconds, maybe. And and this was my reaction. You know, it was pretty cool. <laughs> well, it's, you also it, live very close to Skunk Works, so do I'm you think it was? Away. Yeah, I'm a mile away. So I then, po I posted a video uh, earlier this week. I don't know if you saw it, Christina. It's called "Crazy Night in Palmdale," and this is just a crazy night in Palmdale. So, um, for my backyard, I face Skunk Works, which is a mile away. And then to the north, uh, if this hand is north, so to the north, Edwards is about seven miles away. And this is what happens every night from my backyard. A plane, a giant plane or two will take off from Skunk Works, make a turn, and it doesn't take off. Stays low to the ground, quarter mile, less, above the trees, turns turns towards Edwards, levels out, and lands. That's all it does. And it's like, now what's going from there to there all night long? And I would say that, just like Area 51, in my estimation, um, Edwards is a testing facility. That's what it is. It's a testing, flight testing, and training center. That's all they do, right? Okay. Um, just like Area 51, the secret stuff goes down at Edwards. It's remote, it's difficult to get to, and all of that just like Area 51. Not quite as isolate, isolated as Area 51, but the rumors surrounding Edwards Air Force Base and the activity up above it um, is it, just like this case, uh, this sighting in, in, in the mid-1960s. This is stuff that goes down out here all the time. It's one of the magical spots uh, here in California. So what what is it? Is it aliens? Could be. Is it aliens and secret tech? Could be. Is it just secret tech? Could be. Is it backwards engineered? Could be. Do they have alien bodies buried out there in the desert? <laughs> Probably. But this stuff is happening every single night. And and I've invited uh, friends uh, to come over with the guarantee. We're going to see something. It, it's just, it is a given. So uh, it's 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 crazy. The um, uh, back to this case. 
so many times uh, you can uh, go out into the Mojave Desert where I am and and get out near Edwards, watch a light like this from a low altitude, mm-hmm. change its trajectory, and then go up and appear to be a star. It's just sitting there, and you can see it happen in real time. Now, Christina, if you don't see this part, right, and you miss that, and you're looking up at the sky, you think you're just looking at a star like everybody else, right? That's the crazy part about it. If you get to see the first part, and then you see it, then you have that paradigm shift. You like how I did that? Then you have the paradigm shift, which is, I wonder how many people look up and think that they're looking just at stars Mm -hmm. because once you see it happen for yourself, like this pilot, that's when everything changes, what is going on in the sky. And when you see it happen and you see that position and it just attains uh, the image of a star, you have no idea what's going on up in the skies. Well, every single time I open the door to go outside, instead of looking at my destination, which is the car, I'm looking up in the sky and I don't know how people can walk and look up at the same time. That's a skill that I do not have, but I am practicing on because (laughs) we never know what we're going to see with our own eyes. It's it's so much fun to do. And because of of Edwards and and Lockheed and it's 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 Raytheon it's NASA it's Air Force Plan 42 all of the the, the most secretive uh, development is is just going on a mile from my house so in, in knowing that um and combined with like this sighting and and Edwards um you can go out and and see stuff at any given moment um I would say that <clears throat> the other day I would say that most of the people in Palmdale work there. Okay. So are they looking up at the skies? No, they're just, they know, right? So the other day I'm driving and uh, usually when I drive, I, I call Christina to say hi. This particular time I didn't, but I did take pictures and and I'm driving and off of the runway, I could, I'm, I'm looking down on the skunk works. I'm like two miles away. I see this giant, uh, looks like a commercial airliner take off flies over me low turns and flies over Palmdale sideways. Low, 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 low. It's a few hundred feet in the air and makes this turn levels out, goes back and lands on the other end of the runway. Now, if you were anywhere else in the United States and that crap was going on, can you imagine the phones and the yeah, yeah. <laughs> plane out of the sky? It's waking up my kids. You can't do this. You can't do testing over a city. What are you doing? What are you doing? Not in Palmdale. No, this is like every day. And I couldn't believe it. You would have thought that this was like a major air catastrophe about to happen. And the pilot that is flying this plane, think about him. You know, and 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 what he is doing sideways just a few hundred feet in the air. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, it's crazy. Palmdale is nuts. Edwards is nuts. Um, so, Jimmy, hold on. But before we get into the next story, living in California... What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of California? Tell me in two words or less. Uh, uh, Everything is strange. That was three words. That was uh, good. uh, (laughs) uh, Apostrophe S. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to give you, can I get 90 seconds? Christine, is that okay? Can I get 90 seconds? All right. So I'm looking at property here in Palmdale. And uh, this is uh, over a year ago. I pull into town. I'm staying at a hotel. I'm meeting my real estate agent the next day. And it's about 10 o'clock at night. I wanted a burger. I was in my hotel room. And I was like, man, oh, man, in and out, right? Whatever. So I walk out of the hotel. It's 10 o'clock. And I'm standing at the Jeep. And I look over. And I went, man, Edwards Air Force Base is right there. And I know it, right? It's like, let's go. So I jump in my Jeep and I punch in uh, on my GPS, Edwards. 
I've got it up, and I can see a road south of Edwards, the closest road to Edwards that, that's a road, and I drive for that. And I and what I don't realize, it's at night, that I'm in the middle of the, the bleeping desert at this point. But anyway, so I drive down this road. I take it to the end. I can see on my GPS at T-Bones. So before it T-Bones, I pull over, pull over to the side of the road. Now it's like 10, 15, 10, 30 at night. I pull over to the side of the road. I get out of the Jeep. I walk across the road. And I go right up to a fence, the fences that have uh, uh, no trespassing, you will be shot signs, right? Or the base commander. They're everywhere. They're like, right? Okay. So, and I'm standing in front of one of those. And I look over that. I'm looking at Edwards, and I could see the base lit up. It's a couple of miles away. Uh, it's just open desert, and I'm looking right at it. And I'm like, okay. And I got my cell phone in this hand. And as I absorb what is going on, beautiful black night sky, and, and I'm looking at Edwards, this is what happens. About 10 degrees up above Edwards, just above my sight line in the black sky, I see static from a TV, you know, black and white, and it lights up. And I was like, wow, what's that, right? And as I think to myself, what is that, it... Uh, lights up a ring of lights around the bottom, and it goes one time. <laughs> WTF? Black. It disappears. And I'm looking like this, like, what? And as I think that, it does it again. Black and white static. Ring of lights. Black. Now I get my cell phone out, my heart's right. I get my cell phone out, I put it on video, and I stand there for 20 minutes. Nothing happens. So I I I get in my car and I drive back to the hotel. And I'm thinking in my head, it was a radio tower, there was a light on the top for airplanes, it's some kind of warning light. I'm not thinking UFO. As a matter of fact, I didn't want to think UFO. It was, it was just too crazy. I was trying to think of something terrestrial. Go back. Next day, I wake up, and I'm meeting my real estate agent at 1 o'clock or something, and I have breakfast, and I walk back outside, and I went, whoa, let's go back. So I jump in my car, and, and I drive back. I'm following my GPS. I pull up, same exact spot. I see the tire tracks from the night before in the dirt. And, and I get out, go across the street, and I see my footprints from where I stood. And I look up, and there's Edwards. Here's the crazy part. There was no towers. There wasn't anything up that high. There were things low, but there was nothing up. And where I saw it was there were mountains here, and it was just blue sky. There was nothing there. That, right over the top of Edwards. You know, and, and this is the thing. It was a flying saucer, man. Not, not, not you know, not, I have to use those words. A flying saucer. And and that's it. So, yes, that's, I haven't seen it since. I, I, I still can't explain it. I am sure there was other crazy stuff that happened later on that afternoon. I won't, we don't have the time to get into that. But, um I am sure somebody at Edwards or around here has heard me tell this story. And, and well, hey, Jimmy, Jimmy saw it, you know, but, but I did and I haven't seen it again, but right over the top of Edwards. Oh my goodness. That yeah. is an insane story. And I feel like you don't really catch how exciting that is until you have a sighting of your own. But now let's talk about a very interesting case that happened in 1974 with Ronald Reagan, oh, Hollywood yeah. actor, yes. California governor, and president of the United States. Yep. Yep. Then he was governor, I believe. Yeah, he was governor. Right. And he, he was, was with his, he was with his wife, Nancy. And um, yeah. Okay. So, well, there's a few, which, which, which one is this? Well, let me read it to you. So there were four people aboard an airplane. You had pilot Bill Painter, two security guards, and then governor of California, Ronald Reagan. 
As the airplane approached Bakersfield, California, the passengers called painters' attention to a strange object in the rear. And it, he states, it appeared to be several hundred yards away. That's incredibly close. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly close. Then Painter continues. It was a fairly steady light until it began to accelerate. Then it appeared to elongate. Then the light took off and it went up at a 45 degree angle at a high rate of speed. Everyone on the plane was surprised. The UFO went from a normal cruise speed to a fantastic speed instantly if you give an if you give an airplane power it will accelerate but not like a hot rod and that's what this was like a week later reagan recounted the sighting to norman c miller then washington bureau chief for the wall street journal and reagan told miller quote we followed it for several minutes it was a bright white light. We followed it to Bakersfield and all of a sudden, to our utter amazement, it went straight up into the heavens. When Miller expressed some doubt, Miller states, a look of horror came over Reagan. It suddenly dawned on him that he was talking to a reporter and immediately afterwards, according to Miller, Reagan clammed up and he never spoke about that incident, incident since. Pretty interesting story. Um, uh, he he had so many sightings and was so uh, passionate uh, about the subject. And I think that he exposed himself to too many things uh, too quickly where he came to the conclusion, just before he was president, right. um, that we're being visited. And and he took that initiative all the way to the United Nations. He did eight different speeches around the country mentioning uh, contact with aliens and, and how it would bring the world together. The, the, the clip that I use for Fade to Black is from the United Nations. Shall we play it? Um, no, it's OK. Um, uh, well, you can if you want, but um, <laughs> uh, don't play my intro. You can play the speech. No, no, I, I have I have the speech ready from 1987. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to hear my intro. But here's the deal. Um, uh, because of everything that had happened, um, I think that once he if he had the opportunity to be to become president, that he would make this an initiative. And that wasn't. And here's the deal. That may not even be his best sighting. Um, and he's had so many. There was another one. Um, he's driving uh, down uh, PCH, that's Highway 1, California, PCH um, in California that goes up and down the coast. And he's in Malibu, and he's with Nancy, and they're going to a party. Um, I believe it was at Lucille Ball's house in, in Beverly Hills. So while they're driving down the coast, and I think the reports were they were in his Mustang, uh, like 65 Mustang convertible. And uh, and they see a craft out over the ocean come out of the water and fly up into the sky. And and so they they watch this. They continue and they're, you know, obviously wondering what that was. It came out of the ocean. It was a lit up ball of light and then went up to the heavens. So they get to the party at Lucille Ball's house, and it was somebody's birthday party, uh, some other movie star. Um, I'll think of it in, in a minute, maybe not. Um, but what did they do? They told everybody at the party about this, and everybody was talking about it, and this made it into the press because this is a, a Lucille Ball's house. It's a party. The press is there, and uh, and it's somebody's birthday party, which wasn't the highlight of the evening. The highlight of the evening was Ronald and Nancy's UFO sighting in Malibu while driving to the party. So, yeah, I think that, uh, again, and this happened near the, the Malibu underwater base, and, and not the only sighting um, in that area. There are literally thousands of sightings, reported and documented sightings. And it's another area like Edwards that uh, I'm pretty pretty proud to say 
If you, if you, you know, if you're interested in UFOs and you want to check something out, go out to PCH daytime, nighttime, and just look out o- over the ocean. That, that's all you got to do. And, and chances are you are going to see something. I would say, I mean, I've talked about this with many UFO researchers over the years. If you go back and look at UFO reports um, in Santa Monica and Malibu um, you, and, and look at the dates, it, it's almost every single day. Right, it, it, thousands of sightings in that area. Um, and you have Catalina Island, right? right? You have uh, 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 the coastline from Santa Monica all the way up to Malibu, and then if you go down in the opposite direction from Marina del Rey in Santa Monica, you eventually arrive at San Diego. So it's that area, that little triangle, Catalina, Malibu, San Diego. This this area where it seems to be going on um, all the time, nonstop. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. And there's one researcher in particular that has done a lot of investigations around California, and that's Preston Dennett. So for those that are really interested in the state of California, where there's so much to cover today, we won't be able to cover everything. But if you are interested in this, look at Preston Dennett's research, and you're going to be amazed at the stories that he's found. Like, But like you had mentioned a little bit earlier, Reagan has been heavily involved in in like the interest of UFOs, kind of kind of taking a step back and not being a, a ufologist in, in many respects, but trying to bring up the conversation when, where, when and wherever he can, where it seems appropriate. So for those that aren't familiar with the famous United Nations speech in 1987, it's only 45 seconds long. I would like to play it for those that are, that are new to this. So let's go ahead and play that. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? Incredible. Incredible. Every single time. Gives me the chills. Incredible. And, uh, okay, before we move on, there's no way we're getting all this done today, Christine. I'm just... Unless uh, we talk really fast. And and so, is this... So Reagan's speechwriter, Reagan kept putting this in the speech, right? And this happened dozens of times, people. Speechwriter took it out. Reagan, in the dressing room, (laughs) right, wrote it in the margins and then went out and did the speech and and did it anyway uh, against the advice of his own speechwriter. And these notes and details are at the Reagan Library, and you can check it out for yourself. He was adamant about this issue. And like I said, it wasn't just the United Nations. He did it at eight different public speeches it, during this time period over a few months. And again, <laughs> the speechwriter types it up, hands him the speech, right, with his stuff edited out, and Ronald adds it back into the margin and goes out. And that's what he did at the United Nations as well. Incredible. Yeah, you're right. It gives me chills every time. He believed it to be incredibly important. And now that is the most famous speech in the UFO circles that we know of today. But um, what I want to do more research on before we continue is other presidents being interested in the topic because it seems like it's becoming a consistent theme. So let's jump into the next story. And this one was in 1965 with Rex Heflin. My man. My man, Rex. My man, so, Rex. Okay. Um, man, look at me. I've just lost my, I lost my cookies. This is a big cookie. deal. This Rex Heflin is a big deal, Christina. Um, go. Who is Rex Heflin? So 
He was an Orange County Highway Inspector, and while he was at work in a county vehicle at 12:37 p.m., he saw a hat-shaped object hovering above the road. So he grabbed his Polaroid camera, normally used to record highway obstructions or other problems, and took three photographs of the metallic-appearing object and a fourth of a black smoke ring left behind by the object after it departed at high speed. He reported seeing a rotating band of light on the underside of the object, like a sweep of a radar beam. While he was having this sighting, he tried to radio his base twice during the sighting, but the radio would not work. However, it functioned normally right after the object departed. So one of the photographs was published by the Santa Ann Register on September 20th, 1965, when the story was picked up by the National News Wire Services. I'm going to go ahead and share some pictures here. But Jimmy, what do you want to add to this really famous? Well, yeah, very this famous is photos? probably the most iconic, the most famous picture in all of ufology. Um, that's it. And when I was a kid, um, there it is. When I was a kid, uh, I was probably eight or nine years old uh, getting into this subject. And I opened up the encyclopedia, went to UFO, and that was the picture in the encyclopedia and it has been burned into my my retinas ever since um it is it is truly an incredible set of pictures so the, the what you're showing here um and this is great because it's a pickup truck it's the city pickup truck right. and he takes one out of the front window and he takes a couple out of the side window um and and it's just it's it's an unexplainable unbelievable event um and druffle uh who worked for james mcdonald and druffle uh who's no longer with us she just recently uh, passed away was a guest on fade to black and was one of my uh, favorite uh interviews she was in her mid to late 80s uh when she did the show she she was a neighbor of mine um, out here. So, but on the show, this is what she says to me, Christina, imagine this. We start talking about the Rex Heflin photographs and she goes, I have them. No. I, I said, what? I, I have the original Polaroids, Jimmy. They're in a box under my bed. Would you like to see them? Trip on that, huh? Yeah. And, uh, Okay. So these these photographs um, not only are probably uh, the most famous in ufology, it's this last one that I think is the most compelling. And that is the smoke ring that was left after the craft went poof. And and thank thank goodness that Rex, uh, had the fortitude and, and film in his Polaroid camera. He was fast. That. And that is an incredible, incredible moment uh, to be able to capture that on film. Everything got involved uh, with the Rex Heflin photographs. Now, remember, these were taken in Santa Ana, California, just south of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, you know, this is Los Angeles. This is L.A. This is California. And this is the kind of stuff that goes on here. But after this was done and the reports came out, everything happened. Air Force, men in black, confiscated photographs, um, analyzed. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, they returned the Polaroids, the originals, uh, to Rex Heflin that went to then James McDonald, who Ann Druffle worked for. James McDonald uh, uh, was suicided or committed suicide. And Ann Druffle uh, retained uh, the original Polaroids. Um, Ann Druffle passed away a couple of months ago, or a couple of years ago. And uh, I don't know where those Polaroids are today. What's very interesting about this case in particular is that Rex had no interest in UFOs at the time and continued to think that the objects that he photographed were merely experimental craft from the El Toro Marine 
space. But within a few weeks, many people had become very interested in the photos. And some of Heflin's relatives gave the first three photos, which Heflin had lent them to the Santa Ann Register uh, to, uh, you know, a, a rather prominent newspaper in Orange County. And like I said, that's kind of how it went big. Now, these photos had been analyzed. In particular, computer enhancement and photo analysis was conducted by Robert Nathan at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the JPL, working with first generation prints and copy negatives made by the newspaper, along with but um, along other things, the analysis established photographic evidence to confirm the light beam on the underside of the object. The Air Force issued a statement declaring the photos a absolute hoax, which was then strongly uh, disputed by the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, or NECAP. Now, there are there were unknown parties that later attempted to tamper with the evidence and manipulate information. So the copy negatives were obtained from Heflin under false pretenses by someone pretending to be from the North American Air Force Command. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Men in black, men in black, men in black. But here, um, uh, okay. So keep this up on the screen uh, so everybody can understand what we're looking at. The first in the upper left-hand corner, that is out of the windshield over the hood of the car or the pickup truck. So you are able to triangulate different points on the road. Uh, the telephone pole and all of the analysis was done for distance, height, and the size of the object. The object then flew to the right, and then he photographed it out of the side window as it flew away, and that is the passenger side window of the pickup truck. That is at a great distance, and it's also big. This That's isn't right. a Frisbee. This isn't a hubcap. This isn't anything like that. And then the last photograph was uh, from some distance up the road. He he was, he was I believe... He drove his pickup truck up the road and was uh, trying to follow it. That's and correct. then that's when it disappeared. And that's when the smoke ring was shot. He got out of his pickup truck and then photographed the smoke ring, which was just a short distance down the road that you're looking at in the upper uh, right or upper left hand photograph um, in Santa Ana. And you know what's crazy? Uh, I know California really well in this area. Um, and that's 1965, and look how rural it looks. That same road now in Los Angeles is all city. It's all completely yeah. built over and built up. It doesn't look rural like it does here. El Toro, uh, the Marine uh, Air Base, um, which, by the way, okay, oh, yeah, can we, uh, you want me to tell you what El Toro is famous for, Please. at least in our community? I want to know. Independence Day. The movie. That was El Toro. So that's where, uh, uh, um, what's his name? Will Smith. You know, uh, the the. <laughs> that's where he was stationed. He was stationed at El Toro. So when, um, uh, later on in the movie, when the uh, first lady, right, mm -hmm. uh, she crashes her helicopter, and she's found by um, uh, Will Smith's girlfriend, right? That's at yeah. El Toro. That's at El Toro. So that's the way El Toro looks today in that area. It's all built oh. out. But but there's a little, little trivia action uh, for you there. That's El Toro. Well, Project Blue Book also looked into this case and classified it, from my knowledge, from my research, they classified the photos as a hoax as well. Oh, so everything was a hoax in blue, but Christina. Unfortunately, they were not on our side at the time when they were <laughs> working there. Oh, man. Unfortunate. Now, but, the, okay. go ahead. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> well, see, here's the deal. Um, and I'm looking at the clock. All right. So are we going to split this up? Uh, this is your show. 
I have nothing to do with it. I just, Christina gives me a time. I'm here and I have nothing to do with the show. But that being said, I'm looking at the clock. We're halfway through the show. Do we jump into the crazy stuff or are we going to stay UFO? I mean, let's, let's crazy list. The crazy list is crazy. (laughs) I mean, can I, can I pick one? All right. I'll let you pick the next one. Can we shift? I got to drive the car for a minute. I feel like when my dad said, okay, here's the keys. All right. Drive is home. The three blocks. And I'm all happy. I get to drive the car. I drove home. I drove two blocks. Oh my gosh. The first time I learned how to drive, I actually cried on the road because I didn't know how to merge and there was traffic and I was literally in tears. And my dad's like, suck it up. Just, just merge. And I'm thinking, I can't do it. And now I'm like, get out of the way. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Right. One day, one day, uh, I'll let you drive the Jeep and uh, I'll toss you the keys. And you know what goes on in your head when you drive that? Get out of my way. <laughs> I've got no, no love or concern for anybody right now. You're just driving, looking down. It's awesome. All right. I want to do. Christine Walters. Okay. That's right. I want to go to Christine Walters. This is one of the most incredible unsolved crimes in the history of California. Right. And um, I've been following this case now for 10, 14 years. There oh my she gosh. Is. It's a long time. Yeah, this uh, this happened in 2008 and and really hit the news around here about that time, 2008, 2009, and, and continues uh, to this day. People still talk about this case. Yeah, uh, it's a bizarre one. So I'm going to go ahead and read what I found, and then you can, from absolutely. researching it since 2008, you can kind of say if that was what you thought about that. So on November 12, 2008, a couple near the Northern California city of Eureka found 23-year-old Christine Walters naked, covered in scratches, and bleeding on their doorstep. So they took this woman straight to the hospital where she refused to explain what happened to her. After she was discharged with no drugs found into her body, uh, Walter ended up telling her mother in Wisconsin that she was chased by demons through a forest after she participated in a shamic ritual. So her mother offered to fly her to California offered to fly to California to go and pick her up and bring her back to Wisconsin. But Christine said, no, I'm going to go there myself. However, I don't have any identification. Can you fax it over to me? So when she was on the phone with her mother, she sounded very paranoid a few days after this. She, she was just very scared. However, a few months prior, she was very upbeat and incredibly happy with life. So her family saw a shift in the way that she was communicating. And she really, I mean, from what I found, she believed that there were forest demons that were trying to hunt her. And she, but whenever she went to the hospital, she simply would not explain what she went through. So in order for Christine to return back to Wisconsin, like I said, her mother had to send her ID and her social security card, which were faxed. And then she went ahead, Christine went ahead and collected it at a copying and printing store to pick it up. Now, the workers had stated that she was in PJs and slippers and constantly looking over her, sh- over her shoulder, again, with that sense of paranoia. And that was the last time anyone saw her. She never took the plane back home to Wisconsin. No money was drawn from her account, even when her father wired $1,000, and she was never seen again. Now, it is believed by some that she disappeared on her own accord, but there are others that believe that the group that she had joined and lived with in California, those of spiritual yoga kind of mindset called the Green Life Evolution Center, could have been a cult and she was unable to run away, or possibly the ritual that she conducted could have invited unwanted guests. We simply don't know. This is all merely speculation. However, when she went missing, 
her parents hired a private investigator to look for her missing daughter obviously. And what they found was her ID in a nearby coffee shop, which is weird because Christine had told her family, I don't know where it is. I, I don't know where my ID is. But when they ended up speaking to the coffee shop manager, the manager had stated, oh yeah, Christine leaves her backpack here all the time whenever she wants to go hiking in the forest. This is, this is a continuous thing. I don't know why she told you she didn't know where her, her ID was when she knew it was with me. And then they also, the in private investigator had also found out that this health group, the one that she had joined, uh, looked incredibly sketchy and there was very little information about it. So no one knows what happened to her even to this day. Just merely speculation. When you look at uh, pictures of her, um, and this is a great picture, but when you look at other pictures of her, um, she she was, first off, beautiful, right? Um, uh, she just looked happy, intelligent, together, open-minded, um, could have been a supermodel, right? She had this 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 certain glow about her. Um, and then you combine another element to this, which is Eureka, California. And that area, ah, the police don't go to Eureka. The Eureka police don't hang out in Eureka. <laughs> they don't. And um, there's a location there. It's called Murder Mountain. Um, uh, heavy, heavy pot industry before it was legal. When it was illegal, this was outlaw territory um and the population up there has a very free-spirited mind they don't welcome the police they handle their own business kind of thing and the and that's it that's the atmosphere in humboldt county mendocino, mendocino county uh northern california that's just the way it is now when somebody rolls into town and disappears unfortunately uh, this happens hundreds of times a year, and the the couple of detectives that are covering hundreds of square miles in many cities are completely overwhelmed with all of this. They can't investigate everything, and unfortunately, she's one of the many that this happens to. What's interesting about her case, because so many people go to work on these grow farms, they want to go smoke weed and and listen to the Grateful Dead all day long and 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 trim pot and 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 whatever, right? It's it's an industry. This is this is a way of life up there. Um, and and so those kind of free-spirited people that show up in Eureka and get off of the bus uh with a backpack, hang out in Eureka. This goes on all day long every day of the year law enforcement or anybody else can't keep up with it so when these people show up nobody knows about them nobody knows about their past and once they disappear off into this 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 underworld um chances are I, there's no way to track there's no way to do that that's it she was one of them and she gets classified as that what makes her case different is she got involved with some say a cult, a cult-ish, cult-like community. Um, she gets involved with that. But she's also hanging out in town somewhat, going to this coffee shop, dropping off her backpack there, which was a ritual, and then going off and hiking. So it wasn't like she disappeared off into the hills. People knew uh, who she was. She gets uh, into this, what they call it, tea ceremony okay a tea ceremony with this cult and possibly hallucinogenic drugs don't know um different tea ceremonies with different groups are different things we don't know what was involved with this particular tea ceremony this is all according to her um, i'm doing this all by memory i hope you're impressed uh, this is all um uh going back to the investigator that they hired he found out about the tea ceremony she takes off. She's running through the woods. She's naked and uh, uh, ends up 20 miles away back at this a stranger's house, knocks on the door. She's naked. Her feet are completely cut up. Uh, she is cut up from brambles and, and tree, you know, things. Her whole body is, is messed up and bleeding. 
She begs for help. They call the police. They call an ambulance. That shows up at at the house. Police take a report. The police take her and the ambulance down to the hospital, check her in, clean her up, and the police take her to a motel. Okay? Um, That's right. Yeah, from this point forward, uh, I hope I have all of this right. Again, it's 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 just coming from here. It, it, this is what happens next. She calls her parents, and and um and I'm a little unclear about this. Like, were her parents divorced? Were these two different conversations? It, it didn't. It didn't say that in anything that I was looking through. It because, just said that she called her parents. Right, because two things happened independently. Her mom sends her her ID so she can get a plane ride home. Right. Her dad, in a separate phone call, agrees to send her $1,000, which he did send. She was to then use the ID uh, to fly and board the plane, one, and two, use the $1,000 to buy the plane ticket. She goes to this copy store, whatever it is. Uh, this is all on camera. Um, she goes in security camera footage shows her clutching the papers to her chest. If I remember, like she was just acting real paranoid. Um, she, she gets the paperwork, um, uh, which was a fact. She gets copies of it. Now she can fly in the plane. That was the last time anybody saw her period. And keep in mind, she was incredibly young, just 23. I mean, she had a whole life ahead of her. So the fact that she kind of just disappeared like this um, doesn't really make too much sense with the with the information that we have so far about this case. Yeah. Yeah. And you would think that uh, over the years, because she had uh, a couple of tattoos, she had something, I want to say it was like, you know, I don't know, tree of life or something. Um, on her neck, and she had a couple of other tattoos you can see in the photographs. Um, and you have her name, we have her age, we have all of these incredible, uh, a vast amount of photographs of her, right? And we know I mean, today, I think she would be like 35. Yeah, this happened in 2008. So she would have aged, I mean, she would look very similar to the photographs. Um, and that uh, she would have surfaced by now or contacted her parents or or something would have happened. Um, but here it is, um, absolutely disappeared. If you go and look, now I'm not saying that everybody in Eureka, you know, in Ukiah or any in Northern California, you know, uh, heading up uh, Highway 101, um, that everything is crazy. But there is a culture there um, where uh, they take care of their own business. And because of the amount of, of pot farms up there and the, and the amount of people that want to work, they want to go there. They want to smoke weed and get paid to, to, to work on these farms. Um, these are, uh, they're, they're called trimmigrants, by the way, trimmers. Immigrants, trimmigrants, right? And so uh, everybody's used to this happening. And so if somebody just shows up in a backpack, um, uh, with a backpack uh, in Eureka or any of the number of towns that are up there that are like this, and you're going to go to the police and go, okay, my friend's missing. Okay, uh, what do they look like? A red hair backpack, right? <laughs> it's going to go on a list of 100 people uh, that year with the same exact description. And she fell into those cracks, and 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 until she shows up, we may never know uh, what happened to her. It's a it's a crazy, crazy story. It's a very tragic story, and there's another one that's rather tragic that happened in 1924, and this one's a ghost story. And I'm going to read it to you exactly from Encyclopedia of Haunted Places, Ghostly Locations from Around the World by Jeff Belanger. So it goes like this. Americans have always been fascinated by the idea of stardom. Perhaps that is why some call Los Angeles the land of broken dreams. Many high school drama students have packed his or her things and moved to the land of glitz and glamour in hopes of becoming a star. But more often than not, it ends in headaches. Such is the story of the Black Delilah. 
Elizabeth Short was born on July 29th, 1924 in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. She loved Los Angeles and she wanted to become a star, but it didn't really pan out like that. Her friends nicknamed her the Black Delilah because of the popular dark movie, The Blue Delilah, starring Alan Ladd and Victoria Lake. Elizabeth had jet black hair and a love for black clothing. So she became the Black Delilah. On January 8, 1947, Elizabeth was picked up by a boyfriend by the name of Red Manley for a night on the town. The next morning, Elizabeth told her suitor that she planned to move back home to Massachusetts. But before she left, she said she was going to visit with her sister at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. When her boyfriend left her at the Biltmore Hotel to visit her sister, she was making phone calls in the lobby. He, along with the employees of the hotel, were the last to see her alive. On January 15th, 1947, six days after Manley had dropped Elizabeth off at the Biltmore, she was found dead in a nearby abandoned lot. When police arrived on the scene, they determined that the body had been posed in such a way that appeared almost seductive. Her face had been sliced so that her beautiful smile extended from ear to ear. And to top it off, she had been sliced in two just above the waist when what police later discovered to be a butcher knife. But the cut was so precise that the police believe that it was done by a skilled surgeon and the blood was completely drained. Now, it gets a lot more gruesome than this, and we're not going to cover that here today. But if you do want to look it up, you can just type in the Black Delilah murder, and you can read more of the details on that. Now, the ghost of the Black Delilah has been seen roaming the halls of the Biltmore Hotel, Witnesses report seeing a woman in a black dress with a sense of urgency and distress in her eyes. She has been seen pacing in the lobby and waiting by the telephone. She has been seen sharing rides with elevator passengers. Perhaps she is searching for her killer or waiting for her sister to arrive. We'll never know. The Black Dahlia. That's what I said. Oh, you said Delilah. No, I did say Delilah. But that's Thank okay. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not correcting you. Um, uh, I don't mean it like that. It's that um, Dahlia uh, and the Black Dahlia, when I hear it said like that, um, as I'm used to it, it, it just creates all of these images. There she is there. Now, um, okay. This case... And the way that her body was discovered, um, which was on a sidewalk in downtown Los Angeles uh, next to this empty lot in between houses on a residential street. Um, and it, it it was so gruesome. And for me to describe uh, what they found is, is probably not appropriate for this show. But I'll say this. Um, uh, her body was cut in half. Um, it was mutilated, her arms, hands, legs, torso, thit, everything was cut and mutilated um, in such a way that um, whoever did that, um, and then to turn around and reassemble the corpse, um, uh, I, you know, nobody um, has considered, and this is also a blood issue, that this was done on the scene. No, this was done somewhere else. They pull up on the side of the road, they take her body out and 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 arrange it a certain way on the sidewalk to be found. Now, um, the uh, uh, the movie, the uh, Batman and the Joker, right? And you remember the smile that was painted. Um, that's the way the cut was on her cheeks. Right. So they cut her face to make her smile that went all the way up, which is a horrific absolute to dismember and to face somebody like this. Um, confuse the police. This is this is bad. I mean, it's bad on the most extreme levels. 
But then they found out who she was. And as they go into her past um, and start to investigate things, yes, she was an actor. She appeared in a couple of things, um, an aspiring actress. But things started to unravel. And when you get further into this case, um, this case was connected through politics and the police department and 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 criminal society where um it, this was a serious serious who done it and uh, could there be others um could there be more um into the future uh and and what was really going on here and so they really thought uh, that they were going to solve this case this is 1924 it was almost 100 years ago, still unsolved. Many, many relatives have come forward. I mean, it's a lot. You know, my father did this. My uncle did. He was the Black Dahlia murder, and this is why. Um, there were politicians. Uh, there were uh, members of organized crime that were identified that were part of this. Um, I think Bugsy Siegel was named, you know, at some point. And, and that was the incredible part is that when you are um, getting into the film industry um, and you are an aspiring actor or actress, um, you're going to parties, you're doing things and you and you meet different and 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 things turn into this vast spider web. And it turned out she had made a lot of connections and a lot of people knew who she was. Um, not necessarily from the big screen, but because she was part of this community here in Hollywood. And it is still an unsolved case, the Black Dahlia murder. When I first moved to California, which was 1984, um, I, 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 I got a book and I saw something on TV. And then I, when I went around and, and spoke to the people that lived here, um, in and around Hollywood and would bring everybody has their theory. Everybody here knows about the black Dahlia murder and uh, yeah, still unsolved. And it's, it's still part of the culture here in Los Angeles. And again, uh, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever find out Christina. No, it's, it's an incredibly sad story, but the fact that, um, that, that, there, that her ghost can even be seen of Dahlia. And I I would like to mention that my verbal dyslexia, I, I do wrestle with it. So calling her Delilah instead of Dahlia. So I, I, I do um, apologize on that. And sometimes things just kind of slip. So you please forgive me. Let me jump in. I, I, I forget what it was. I don't want people to go back and listen. I'm not, I, no. But one night on Coast to Coast, I said a, a word incorrect for four hours, right? <laughs> oh, and, uh, and, and the next day, uh, somebody called or wrote and said, church, that's not how you say it. And I went, Oh my goodness. And I did it for four hours. ago. So Christina, welcome to the club, man. You're just, you're just, you're a broadcaster now. That's all. That <laughs> it happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. It's, I couldn't believe it. It was painful to me. To it, yeah. That's how I feel right now. And I'm like, I'm reading the live chat and I'm thinking, I can't believe I said it incorrect. Cause like in my head, it sounds correct. And then yep. I said it out loud and I'm like, yeah, I'm saying this right. And it's, and my my just verbal dyslexia got all over the place, and it's gotten a lot better doing shows for a year, but it's still not perfect. You but just graduated. You graduated. You went up <laughs> a level. That's all. That's all that means. Well, back back to the story before we continue. And I know that there's no way we're gonna get through everything today. So let me let me hold a poll to see if y'all want us to do a part two next week. I mean, there's so much more with UFOs, cryptids, ghosts, uh, disappearances, and real high strangeness. So vote on it and let me know if you want to do a second week on Mysteries of California. But talking about Dahlia, a lot of these things that you had mentioned about the dismember where she was being chopped up, um, it was all post-mortem. So it it's not believed to have happened to her when she was alive. Yeah, there was no blood. Yeah, right. it's, a, it's a crazy. Um, I remember, uh, and I, I I don't like to remember this, but I remember the first time I saw the crime scene photos, and I you know, and I saw her, you know, her face and and her body, 
And I don't know what allows somebody to do that to another human being. I don't, I don't care what's, what's going on, man. Uh, uh, I mean, if somebody's already dead, let it go. Right. Okay. I, 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 why, why take it? To, and then place the body in a car, the parts drive, get out of the car, pull that, uh, the body parts out and reassemble on the sidewalk where it's going to be seen. That's that's crazy. What kind of who does this? Who what does, goes through your mind? Or something yeah, like it's, that. It's, ghost, it's unbelievable. Her ghost is absolutely. This is an unsolved murder, and and she is wandering Hollywood, and and good on her. She needs to. She needs to get this, uh, get this thing solved, and and. And so she can go and find peace. It's a it's a crazy case. Crazy case. I mean, L.A. is, is a very dark and mysterious place. So we have about 15, 20 minutes left. There's one more story I want to cover. And I really, really want to cover this case. So okay, let me write one, it down. Hold on. One, I'm going to take a guess. I'm going to take a guess. Let me write it down. I'll, I'll and, give you a hint. No, don't give me a hint. Let me write it down. Let me write it down. Let me write it down. Okay. I just wrote it down. Let me put this out like this. Okay, I got it. What's, what would you pick? Okay. So when we were doing Mysteries of Utah and Mysteries of Arizona, we covered some pretty bizarre locations such as a petrified forest. You take a rock and you become cursed with the most evil, terrible bad luck. Well, there's a pretty bizarre place in California that I think we need to cover. And what is Jimmy's guess? That is right. The Sailing Stones of Death Valley. Now, before doing research, I had never, ever, ever heard of this location, heard of this story. Blew my mind. I want to blow your mind, too. So let's get into this. I'm going to go ahead and start by sharing my screen so you can look at exactly what I'm looking at because it's kind of a bizarre photo really is so let me go ahead and pull that up here it is Bang. thinking what's the story behind this well, let me tell you so located on the border of california and nevada death valley national park was designated in 1933 and is home of one of the world's strangest phenomena rocks that move along the desert ground with no gravitational cause so known as sailing stones, the rocks vary in size from a few ounces to hundreds of pounds. And though for almost a hundred years, no one has ever seen them actually move in person, the trails left behind the stones and periodic changes in their location make it clear they do move. And when you before before we continue, Jimmy, when you heard this story, what was going through your mind? What was the reason? How how could these rocks be moving from from your uh, from your right, viewpoint? Right. Okay, I, I first heard about this probably thirty five years ago or so, and uh, and there were a group a group of my friends were going out to see these. It's like, what are you guys talking about, man? The sailing stones, man, they move by themselves across the depth. What 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 what? what? Can I go to? Yes, you can. And that's what I saw right there, right? So we get out there. Uh, thank you for showing this is bringing back memories. Um, I've o only been back there one time since. But uh, so they're trying to tell me, and I'm trying to understand, and you can't. You can't wrap your head around it. And when we pulled up and and I'm looking at, uh, a, a, a mark from the stone that didn't have a, a, a beginning point. It just went out for miles, right? It was just gone. And you look and you see the stone and you see the mark and you obviously know it traveled this great distance. And how did it, you're thinking of everything, man, this is magic. This is Gandalf, right? This is Mark. <laughs> this is, this is, this is unexplained, right? This is crazy. And you have all of these strange thoughts when you see these out in the middle of the desert. It's it's so what goes through your mind, I'm telling you, um, fairies, 
you know, you're thinking all those crazy, I guess those stories are true. Um, because this seems like magic. And when you see it in person, um, it's, it's, it's a mind blowing thing. So continue, but yes, I have been there and, and you, 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 you just get confused. You really do. You get confused. Well, when this, when this was first kind of open to the public in 1933 as becoming a national park, you would definitely think this was magic, without a doubt. So the racetrack Playa Stones only move once every two or three years, and most tracks last for three or four years. And you know, this this is this is Death Valley, right? So with fewer than two inches, about five centimeters of rain annually, and a recorded high temperature of 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Insane. Mm -hmm. So many of the largest rocks have left behind trails as long as 1,500 feet, suggesting they've moved a long way indeed from their original location. Rocks with a rough bottomed surface leave straight trails while smooth bottomed rocks tend to wander and the sailing stones have been observed and studied since the early 1900s and several theories have been suggested to explain their mysterious movements it was long thought that these strong winds pushed the stones but more you know fantastical theories include uh Involving the magnetic field. And of course, I think with every kind of theory, you got aliens. People think that aliens are the ones moving this. However, in 2014, scientists aided by the Scripps Institution of Oceanology, NASA, and others announced they had solved the mystery. And they were able to capture the movement of the stones for the first time using time-lapse photography. So the results strongly uh, suggested that the sailing stones are the result of a perfect balance of ice, water, and winds. In the winter of 2014, rain formed a small pool that froze overnight and thawed the next day, creating a vast sheet of ice that was reduced by midway to only a few millimeters thick. Driven by a light wind, These sheets broke up and accumulated behind the stone, slowly pushing them forward. So the scientists caught this on camera and they stated that these rocks can slide up to 15 feet, about three to five meters per minute. And they saw many other instances of sailing stones as well, but they became the first people to see the stones in motion. So Richard Norris, one of the scientists, said, science sometimes has an element of luck. We expected to wait five or ten years without anything moving. But only two years into the project, we just happened to be there at the right time to see it in person. So the mystery has been solved, but it is still just an incredible incredibly intriguing location it's so cool i'm ta- I, I you know i'm standing there with my friends i used to go huh all right what <laughs> I did, and uh i remember um uh seeing a tv show about this with the film crew and, and the time lapse stuff and it kind of bummed me out um I, I i i i don't know if i ever really wanted to find out <laughs> uh, because you know why um it's it's it, it's wind it's it's natural you know it's this um could it be something magnetic under the earth again something natural okay all right but man it, it was just so cool to look at so when the tv show the special um i don't know if it was MythBusters or whatever um i i'm making that up but it was a show like that and they they showed the time lapse photography i didn't right. watch it I didn't watch it. Deliberately I did not oh, watch it. No, no, no. no. I don't, don't kill it for me. I still believe in Santa Claus, and I'm not going to watch, you know, these 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 rocks windsurf on, on sheets of ice. But, uh, you know, good on them. Okay, all right. They should have just left this alone. 
and uh, left it mysterious. I mean, I think it's very cool. When I first saw it, I'm just like, what? And then I read the theory and I'm like, oh, okay. This is still very cool. Jimmy, <laughs> we have 10 minutes left. Let's cover one more case. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay hold on. I like Do you want to guess? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm okay, gonna okay, guess. okay. Oh, I'll, I'll let you guess. You got to cover one more case, one that's pretty famous, but. Okay, no. Shh, 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 shh. All right. Those in the live chat also take a guess. What's okay. the next case going to be? Okay. It's a famous one. I'll give you a hint for those in the live chat. It happened in Los Angeles. Oh, I got it wrong. <laughs> I picked. I picked the Winchester Mystery House. Oh, that one's cool. We'll save it for next week. That one's a really cool story. I write like you can't read this. That looks like no, it's like doctor handwriting. Yeah, okay, so the, the side of the the craft <laughs> in Rendlesham. That's what Jim Peniston saw. <laughs> okay, um, 1942. I'm guessing. Brian got it right. It's Battle of Los Angeles. Now, this one, this story is a pretty famous one. I'll be honest with you. I was not really familiar with it. I, I know I've heard of it. I've heard very brief stories of it, but I didn't really know much about it. So we're going to cover that in nine minutes. We can do this. Go. Jimmy, you know, I always do the summaries. I'll let you do the summary this time. Okay. Just the flat, the flat, simple okay. summary. Okay. Okay. Flat, simple summary. I don't have, okay, that's the cover of the LA Times right there. That's the famous photograph, which shows an apparent diamond-shaped object. Um, now, this happened uh, at the beginning of 1942. We're in the middle of World War II. Um, up and down the coast of the United States, we were very concerned with the Japanese and an invasion into uh, the western United States. Of course, we know what happened at Pearl Harbor. And so everybody was on alert. We didn't know if anything would or uh, uh, might uh, uh, would happen. And would it come from the air? Would it come from the sea? Would it be submarines? We we just didn't know. But everybody was on alert. We were all looking due west out across the Pacific Ocean uh, for anything. So during this high state of alertness, a craft shows up along the coast of uh uh, Santa Monica, uh, just they call it uh, the Battle of Los Angeles, but uh, this is right where we keep talking about in between Catalina Island and and Santa Monica. Um, now from Santa Monica uh, uh, down uh, to Long Beach and San Pedro, uh, down there that's a, a, a large naval installation. Um, our port of entry into Los Angeles is down there. And heavily, heavily defended and fortified. So there are a couple of hills down there that have uh, massive, still does to this day, um, uh, any aircraft, uh, missile systems, and, and guns. Um, because this was World War II, there were anti-aircraft positions all the way up uh, the coast into Santa Monica, and then, of course, the Santa Monica Mountains, um, which still uh, missiles and, and things are, are up there. And, uh, that's uh, defense stuff, and I'm not going to talk about it. But this is Los Angeles, and this is the coastline, and it's heavily defended. This object shows up. Uh, uh, it's picked up on radar. It is seen from the ground, um, and they light it up with searchlights, as you can see, and they friggin' open fire. Mm -hmm. They shot. They shot a lot, Christina. They shot um, an estimated 1,200 anti-aircraft rounds at this. 1,200. Now imagine, just imagine, in your neighborhood, wherever you live, Christina, everybody listening to my voice, wherever your town is, just imagine if cannons started shooting at an object in the sky in your town all night long, 1,200 rounds, you would lose your mind. And so did the people of Los Angeles. This went on all night long. And it was never shot down. It stayed in the sky. And that's, that's I mean, it is still... It is still one of the most incredible moments in Los Angeles history to this day. 
Um, we we never found out, uh, you know, by dawn's early light, right? Sun comes up, nothing's there. Incident over. Well, the the best part of the story, I think, my favorite part of this story, is first the military had stated. Y'all are just too trigger happy. You, you guys are paranoid. You got the jitters. You got the nerves. That's why this whole shooting happened. Right. Then they're like, no, no, no. Actually, it wasn't a false alarm. You weren't trigger happy. It was actually a weather balloon. A weather balloon. A weather balloon. 1,200 rounds of any aircraft cannon fire. And it didn't, it didn't. It didn't fall out of the sky. And that was the one thing, you know, that uh, I want you to continue. But one of the things that everybody, what do you mean? You couldn't shoot a balloon out of the sky? What 1,200 rounds of anti-aircraft, and, and you're trying to tell us it was a balloon, and you didn't shoot it down? So continue, Christine. There's a lot of flaws. There's a lot of flaws there. But you practically covered the whole story. I mean, you had people were seeing this orangish type of object in the sky they saw flickering lights they were scared because pearl harbor had just happened about two months ago and they're thinking let's shoot at it they kept shooting they kept shooting 1400 rounds and they couldn't shoot this whatever it was down military comes back a few days later and saying nope it's just a false alarm everyone nothing to be scared of nothing to see here then they're like actually it's not good enough it was actually a weather balloon, but millions of people in the area were terrified because you're having these sirens go off. The whole town was stated to go pitch black, right? Because it's people this had heart attacks and died, right? There were car accidents. Everybody that died in the Battle of Los Angeles was from fear, you know. And that's and just imagine the panic that was going on. This is Intense. loud. This is loud. It's cannon fire. In your town, on your streets, and they're looking at you know the the searchlights and the spotlights lighting this object up in the sky and just poof, 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 poof. you know it's it, it was it was crazy. So yeah, people had heart attacks and died. People had car accidents trying to get out of town. Panic. Yeah, it was nuts. It was nuts. It was a very scary time to witness, Jimmy. We are, we're going to have a part two to Mysteries of California. Today is Fader Night, right? What's that? It's the best time of the week. Oh, the best day of the week. And the best time of three hours. Dang. Yeah, tonight's Fader Night. Open lines all night long. And uh, I'll see everybody there. Um, I got a big surprise for everybody tonight. Um, I'm using our old phone numbers. Yeah. I don't yep, know what, yep, what yep, does yep, that yep. what does that uh, imply? Uh, oh, oh, over the years, um, I've had three, four, five numbers, and then for probably four or five years, uh, we ran uh, two phone numbers. Um, and on my other phone system, uh, uh, what I didn't do because I was busy this week, I didn't go and reformat my normal phone system with my uh, current phone number on it. So that's still sitting there, but now I'm pulling up the old phone system and those phone numbers are still there. So we're going to go back to the old phone numbers uh, from last year or a couple of years ago. And so I'm going to throw everybody for a loop tonight. Oh, that's, that's exciting. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, you got to, you got to, you, you got to change it up. It. Yeah, you got to spice it up a little bit, you know, a little yeah. action, make sure that everybody's paying attention. So I'll see everybody tonight. Christina, you're the absolute very best. Look forward to part two. Are we going to yeah. do it? Next week, part two next well, week. Well, I put a poll up and I said, shall we do a Mysteries of California part two next week? And we got 76 votes. 87% said yes. 13% said no. Why? Yeah. 13% <laughs> why? That 13% was Mark Tasaka. Okay. I'll see everybody. I'll see everybody tonight on the show. Christina, you're the absolute very best. I'm going to go eat some more ramen. I'll oh, see you. I'm jelly. All right. Bye, Jimmy. Well, hopefully you enjoyed today's show. We covered a lot, but still not enough. I mean, so much so that I had to pull a poll up and say, are we going to do a part two? The majority of you said yes. Therefore, we will have a part two on the Mysteries of California 
next Thursday. I do want to remind you that we have an after show chat on Discord. If you want to continue this conversation, bring it over to the Discord. Tomorrow, Strange Paradigms at 3 p.m. PST with Nicole Sakach. And we're covering all the strange and <laughs> mysterious news of the week. And I said that and Jimmy's just laughing in the back. So I'm trying to make it sound cool. It's a really cool last name, just like Tasaka. Sakach. And Jimmy's just laughing. But um <laughs> So you don't want to miss that. Make sure to hit the bell if you're watching this on YouTube so that you can watch it live because that show in particular is about getting your insights, your opinions, your ideas on the things that we cover. And let me tell you, there are some weird things that happened this week. So you don't want to miss the show. I will see all of you tomorrow. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies.